I've been talking to you about truth, and one of the, let me just tell you, if you are not watching the news, I don't blame you, uh, but if you are watching the news, um, gosh, you cannot look at the news today and not see the unveiling of all this. I, I never, in my mind, in my wildest dreams, I never thought some of the things that are taking place, even though the Bible said they're going to start taking place, and we'll see Israel surrounded on all sides, we'll see the, uh, the world turning against Israel, and you're going... All the things that is going on right now, even America right now is, is kind of waffling a little bit on support of Israel, the, our government is anyway. Um, I will let you know this, they will be victorious. Um, God's already said it's going to happen that way and they're going to suffer some in the midst of all this, but they're going to be victorious even with all of what's going on around them. So I, I tell you that because when you watch the news, I was watching it the other night and I see what is going on even with this, this group that's taken over this Islamic state that's trying to form their Syria and Iraq. They're going back to crucifying Christians. Um, and so there are things that are taking place and it is amazing how it unfolds before our very eyes and the things that are happening. And I, I'll just give you that because I really feel like we need to be so adept in what's going on, and we need to be in prayer. You need to know what is happening. You, just kinda, you need to have your spiritual antennas up and looking at all this. And it is, there's never been a greater time for us uh, to seize hold of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and preach that. Because there are going to be a lot of folk that are looking for something, of some kind of hope in the midst of all this. It has yet to unfold here. I was reading that uh, we were out in Yellowstone a few years ago, and I was reading in some of the prophetic newsletters and different things, and, and the seismologists and all those guys are saying there could be a super mass volcanic explosion uh, starting there at, or, at Yellowstone, and, and it could be even greater, umpteen times greater than what we saw at Mount St. Helens. But you look at all the things that are happening and things that are going on, it is imperative that we stay in a place of prayer and in tune with the Spirit of God. And then God is going to raise up in these days leadership, even for this nation, for the world. He'll raise up people that can lead and direct. Right now, there is a leadership vacuum in our nation. Uh, we're not leading anybody anywhere. We're leading ourselves down a dead-end road as far as a nation goes. But there is a leadership vacuum, and it is so imperative that we as Christians pray and we, we preach the truth. In this passage of Scripture, there was something that Paul started doing, and he was working in the synagogue of where he was right there in, in, in Ephesus, and, and it said he spoke for three months. It said, arguing persuasively. You'll find this in verse 8 of this same passage in Acts 19. He was arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. This is where that I believe the church, we are laying down a little bit. We're not arguing very persuasively. We, when we talk about, and I appreciate Mary Ann's loaned us this banner for this, this series of truth and what we've been preaching on truth. But we're living in a time where the world is looking for the truth. Now, there's a lot of things that are happening all around the world, and I talk about the current events and what we can see going on in the current events. And, and I look and I say, God, what is the vacuum that has hit America more than anything else? And in the vacuum meaning there's an empty spot in America, and I think one of those things that we're not doing well, and that is proclaiming the truth. I mean, claiming that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life. Well, Paul spent three months here, and then he said they became obstinate. In other words, they got to where they did not want to hear this anymore. And so he moved, and they refused to believe, and they publicly maligned what they called the way. And they publicly mind Paul, and they publicly mind the Christian faith, and we're right there in the middle of that. If we're not proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the only way, they will come to your doorstep. And I, and I felt so, and, I, and you need to pray for the Christians in Mosul and, and the places in Iraq where they're just taken out, and they're, just, they're saying either you convert or you die. Now, you think about that, folks. When we were growing up, it was the Russians that were going to do that to us when we were in youth group. It was the Russians and the Iron Curtain that were going to come over. The communists were going to tell us, do you convert or you die? And we're moving to a place where I was always wondered, because I knew it wasn't going to be communism, but you see the, the radicalization that's going on all throughout the Middle East and what is taking place. And, and it's going to take a, basically a world war to either stamp it down or knock it out because you're not going to see people just change their minds overnight. Unless we're preaching this gospel, and we've got to preach it here in America because we've got a bunch of folks right now in America that do not know Jesus Christ. And we can argue persuasively all we want, and as Paul did for three months in this synagogue, and said they became more obstinate. They refused to believe, and they publicly maligned them. And folks, that does not mean that you can stop. 
That doesn't mean you can, you can quit doing it. So we need to preach the truth. And that's the first P in this part of this, this sermon. That is we've got to proclaim. Paul did it for three months. And then it says that he left there and he started discussions in this hall of Tyrannius. And basically that was a guy that was ed, doing education of that day. Let's just picture the public school room of today. They went into the place because they'd use it in the mornings and it was empty during the afternoon. So Paul would sit there for the next two years. And he would proclaim the gospel. Now I'll tell you something. I, I like going in a place and you preach and everybody gets saved and we can go home. Paul went there for two years. And he was proclaiming Jesus. Said It went on for two years that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now here's the key to us today and where we're living. We're living in a place where I believe the truth has got to be proclaimed. And that truth has got to be that Jesus Christ is the only way. There's not a bunch of different ways. There's only one way to come to Jesus Christ. That means that we have got to repent of our sins. And sins do not change. And I don't care what culture says and how culture works this out and what they don't want to do and what they say is that's not sin anymore. But it's still going to be if the Bible calls it sin, it's still sin. And so we look at it and we say we need to repent of that. We can refine ourselves the best we want to, but we still have to come to proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the only way. And the only way to get to Jesus Christ is that we've come through repentance. Now, Paul preached that gospel, got maligned in the synagogue, went to this hall, and it said that the word of God, he heard, they heard the word of God in the province of Asia. And then as you look at this, God always does this. If, and this is one thing I believe that at times, and I look around the church, and I wonder if we're going to preach that Jesus Christ is the only way if it costs us everything that we have. And I feel for that, and I really, my heart was going out to the Christians that have lived for thousands of years there in Iraq, and, and they've lived in a Christian community, and now this group has come in and says, you either leave, convert, or you're going to die. Now, we are living in semi-protection here in America. We whine when somebody comes back at us and says, you know, I don't like that Christian thing. Well, we'll tuck our tail and just kind of run off over in the corner because we're like, oh, I didn't really want to offend anybody. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Look, they're in the living and dying for it. And, and I, I saw the, the horrific picture of the, the people they crucified there in, 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 in um, Syria because they said that they will not crucify other Muslims. It was like the emphasis was that they would crucify some that said they wouldn't be as radical as them. But they don't do that. They only crucify Christians. And they actually put them on display for several days. And so when you start seeing that, that strikes chords of fear. But then you look at those that... Say, for instance, a young lady that was just released and she had an audience with the Pope, this, the Sudanese Christian. They said, are you going to convert or you die? She said, I die. Okay. And all the world cried out and said, you got to release her. She's got a baby. She's got to be here. But I'm telling you, there are Christians around the world that are dying for the cause of Christ. And they're saying, I will not convert. These were people that you look at and they've given their lives over to Jesus. But then you've got this, this faction out there that's just trying to crush every kind of opposition. And they do it through weaponry of this world. The Bible tells us in Romans the 10th chapter, how will they hear unless somebody preaches the good news, unless they proclaim the gospel? And the Apostle Paul was writing that to the church in Rome, and he gives them that, and he tells them, he said, there's no way that they can hear unless they have a, somebody to proclaim, someone to preach. And I want to read this to you. It says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Our job right now, in, in this time, this day, the reason we are left here is, number one, is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. It's going to get harder, folks. That's why he also says there in Romans, about the 14th chapter, he says, you need to work because the night is coming. There is a darkness that is coming. Folks, I cannot emphasize enough. Get your testimony together. Share your testimony wherever you go. People are longing to hear it. People are longing for hope. I've used that passage of Scripture in Romans 15 a lot over these past few weeks. I prayed over a couple of ladies working in the, uh, the hospital. And I went, when I went to visit Bill, I was standing at the thing, and, and we were joking around and stuff with nurses. I was waiting on something to joke around with the nurses. And I said, we as Christians are horrible. We'll say, hey, I'll pray for you. And we walk off and we forget. And we don't pray for you. And, they, and I said, but let me pray for you right now. And boy, we were having a little revival right there around the nurse's desk. That was a lot of fun. You know, and I got a chance to pray for her because I was about to leave. And this girl said, you said you'd pray for me. I said, come on, baby, we're going to pray and we'll make it happen. 
But God, the world is waiting for some kind of hope. And I was praying that. And may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. Folks, we've got one of the greatest messages the world has to hear. That's why Paul tarried in, this, in, in the Asian province there and in, in the church in, in Ephesus was born out of this passage of scripture right here. And he was preaching that for two years straight. Now, I don't know. Most of us, we kind of give up after about five minutes. But God was, I mean, he's saying, look, you've been maligned. There are people that are obstinate. There are people who don't want to hear it. But there was something that took place here. And this is when we're proclaiming the gospel. Here's the second thing that God does. He prepares the way. And what I mean by that, he incubates. And he cannot incubate something that has not been seeded into someone's life. How will they know unless we proclaim? And I believe that we are the ones that are to proclaim. What is it that you have in your life? Do you have salvation? Do you know that if you were to pass away right now, you'd be in the presence of the Lord? If you do not have that assurance, you can have that assurance. You can today. But if you have that assurance, that ought to be the greatest message you got. I mean, this is not all there is. That When we step out of this life, we drop this clothing of this flesh and everything that we've always known. Gravity has no pull on us and we step before the Lord. Awesome. What a privilege that is. And I look at this and I say, God, would you give us enough boldness where we'll proclaim your word as Paul did for these two years. Obstinate people didn't want to hear it. But then when he proclaimed the word, I'll use this word, God will always incubate that word with his presence. The Holy Spirit will, let me just, you go back to, I remember a preacher preaching in Genesis one time. He talks about how the spirit of God hovered over the chaos and the darkness. He incubated that word. He incubated until the order came. And I believe that's what he does. If we do not proclaim, we don't give him anything to incubate. Now, can he do it? Through you see the, he said, all of us, none of us going to be, all of us going to be without excuse when we get before him. Because even the glories of, of the earth proclaim who he is. But it's what he desires out of us that we proclaim this gospel. And when we proclaim it, he'll incubate that word. It may not come to fruition that day. You know, you talk to people, and I've talked to people. We've all talked to those people, and you walk away, you're going, boy, I just like might as well be talking to dirt somewhere because they didn't get it. But here's what I know. God will incubate that word. Our job is to proclaim, not to change. Our job is to proclaim, not to save. That's God's job. As we proclaim, his presence and is the preparation part of that. It incubates that, and that's what you'll find in Isaiah. And I love that promise, and we all go to that promise. It says, as the rains and the snow come down from heaven and do not return without watering the earth and make it bud and flourish, that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So my word that goes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose in which I sent it. Wow, that's a promise of God. He promises us if we will just proclaim with our words, then he'll incubate that word and he will cause it to bring back to him the very thing that he promised he would do. He can see that salvation has come to people's lives. I want to see that more than every, anything else. But let me give you this warning. This is the third thing that happens. Not only does he tell us to proclaim and he prepares the way by incubating that, but then that is going to be one of the, the next thing that happens. It does stir the heavenlies. And when you start stirring the heavenlies, persecution will rise up. That's what the Paul started when he was incubating the word. When God was proclaiming the word for those three months, he said the obstinate people came. They started rising up and they're saying, you can't do this. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you, we're living in a time to where if you proclaim that sin is sin, it's going to be hate speech. It's going to become, you think, well, there's no way that will ever happen in America. Folks, it is already here. It is already here. You can't say to somebody, hey, you're in sin, you need to repent. And when you start saying that, they're going, right now we're, we're safe in this sanctuary. You go outside these walls and you start saying that, or you start thinking that people, I mean, you watch what's happening and some of the folks that are, are, are standing in the gap for those life, pre-born lives, and they're getting beat up there on the sidewalks because those are coming by and they'll take off their signs, they'll do whatever they got to do because they don't want truth to be known to these young ladies that are going in these abortion mills. All they're about is the money. It's not even about whether it's life or death. They, they're about money, and that's it. And so I look at what we're, we're battling right now in the heavenlies. You start stirring up the heavenlies. And that's what happens when you proclaim. Do not kid yourself. When you proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, God can incubate that word. But understand this, the heavenlies start getting stirred up. 
That's why you'll see when Paul was writing, and in, in this is one of the churches that you see a lot of the supernatural in, in as far as the church in Ephesus. And that's why he says in Ephesians 6 chapter, it says, finally be strong in the Lord, mighty in, in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God to take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against uh, authority and against the powers of a dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If you want to proclaim the gospel where God can incubate that word, the next thing that's going to happen, all Hades is going to break loose. Don't even kid yourself. You say, well, I don't want to do that. If that's going to happen, well, it's going to happen whether you proclaim or not. There's no truce in this. Watch what, now, this is one of those parallels you can see in the natural. Well, how many truces have been broken over the past two weeks between Israel and Hamas? I hear time they say, I got a truce, and next thing, another missile. That's exactly the way the enemy works with us. Okay, I'm going to call time out with the devil now. Now, you don't bother me, and I won't bother you. Just let me get out of here with my skinny skin skin and go to be Jesus. I won't bother you anymore. Oh, he'll go, okay, I'll sign that. The next thing you know, here comes one of those missiles he lobs. Next thing you know, he, uh, he does not keep his word. God is the only one that keeps his word. You cannot call a truce with the enemy. It doesn't work. You can't say, well, if, if I don't raise, and, and I've had people to do this, I won't raise my kids to be radical for Jesus because I don't want them to be made fun of. Come on now. You're going to protect them that much? I'd rather them running headlong into the battle with the weaponry they need to win this thing. Not hiding somewhere over in the corner going, oh, I don't want my child to be beat up because they live for Jesus. Give them an example. You go out and get a little persecution cranked up in your life. Let them know that you can stand under whatever assault the enemy has. He comes at us, folks. I'm telling you, don't kid yourself. This is why you're reading that scripture when we were reading there, and it says that the seven sons of Siva, they actually went out and they were going to do exactly what Paul was doing. There was the heavenly started stirring up. There were things. There were people being, demons being cast out. And here's the extraordinary miracles. Do not buy those handkerchiefs from the guys on TV unless you really, really want something to wipe your nose with. I don't have a lot of confidence in that. What I have confidence in, my God is the healer. My God is the one who can do that. I'd take a church that will lay hands on you before I buy a handkerchief off TV. We got a church here to lay hands on you and pray for you. I'd rather have that, but I'm, that's not a side. That's my rabbit trail. So even handkerchiefs and aprons, this is where they get that from when they try to say a handkerchief and apron or something else that touch. They were, and were taken to the sick. And their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Listen, when we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, God is incubating that word. He's preparing that in order to come to fruition. The devil is not going to like it, man. He is going to stir up. And it's going to get stirred up. Just think about Tony Dungy over this past week and what he said. All he said is he didn't want the controversy around at Michael Sam's. And his homosexuality, and he wouldn't want it around his team. He didn't say anything about him. He just said, I wouldn't want the controversy if I was a coach. Boy, they're going to eat him up and spit him out. I'm going to tell you something. That man is a man of integrity, and he stands firm. And as a coach, I'd follow. Because he's a man that what he says, he means, and he means what he says. He said, I didn't say anything disparaging. And he did not. But you can't say a thing about certain things in this, this America today. You can't. You don't have the right to say anything. So we're sitting there looking at it, and we're going, okay, God, would you do something in the midst of all this? Well, here's the heavenly start stirring. You saw it happen. Anytime somebody speaks, the heavenly starts stirring. Evil, the enemy is there to persecute. He is there to lay his schemes. He is there to try to take when this word is being incubated. He is trying to destroy that incubation process. He's the fox in the hen house trying to make things happen. Folks, I, if I could tell you anything today, if you want to preach the word, God is going to show up, he'll incubate it, but then he's going to stir up. There's going to be a stirring that happens in the heavenlies. What happens when you commit yourself to prayer? Anybody ever done that? I'm going to commit to 30 days of prayer. All Hades breaks loose, doesn't it? You have the hardest time. You could have prayed better the week before if you hadn't made that commitment, couldn't you? You were praying much better before you made that commitment. What happens when the last time you say, I'm going to read through the Bible. Oh, you were reading through the Bible fine until you made that commitment, didn't you? <laughs> Next thing you know, I don't have near much time. I used to have. You used to read all the Bible all the time. Now you made that commitment. What happens the next time you make a commitment for the Lord? You say, hey, I'm going to make this commitment. You say, well, I don't want to make that commitment. I've heard people say this, none of y'all, but I've heard people say this. Well, I want to make that commitment because I've got, I'm, I'm, it's going to be so hard. Folks, I'll tell you something. Draw a line in the sand every once in a while. The enemy does it all the time. He'll tell you this. He said, if you, if you just stay on that side of the line, I won't bother you. Don't kid yourself. He's coming after you. 
He hates you with everything that's in his being. You know why? You remind him because you're made in the image of God. And number two, you have the potential of defeating him every day in the standing in the righteousness of Christ. Not your righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. Those are two things he hates. He hates it. When we get it and we finally go, okay, I got it now. He hates that with everything. And I use that word strongly because I believe the enemy hates you and you cannot call a truce with him. And that's why Paul, when you start seeing this, it said the evil spirits were getting stirred up. You're casting out evil spirits. They're casting out demons. That's what I asked the Jehovah's Witness the other day. I said, y'all ever cast out any demons? I mean, oh, what? Who? Who? I said, yeah, the Bible says we're supposed to be doing that. Anyway, it always throws them off a little bit, getting supernatural. Some Jews went around driving out evil spirits and said that these guys got overpowered because they came in the Jesus that Paul preached, not the Jesus they knew. It wasn't a personal relationship. It was the Jesus that Paul preached. And it said that they got beat senseless, ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now, I'll tell you, don't ever, don't ever go in there thinking, well, I can do this in my strength, ever. But I'll tell you something, don't ever hesitate to do it in God's strength. Don't ever back up. You can stand firm in that day, I'm telling you. There are times that God has spoken. He's saying, this is what I want you to do, you know, do this. And you're going, I, I don't know if I can do that. Folks, at our weakest point is where his grace is sufficient, is what the Apostle Paul said. In my weakness, I will boast of his grace because that's where his power is made known to me. He will ask you to go to places and do things and say things that you're going, I can't do that, God. I don't want to do that. I, but if you get to that place, you ever come to that place and okay, God, I'll submit. I'll do it. Boom. Guess what? God's going to do something awesome. Here's the next thing you see. It said that when all this happened, when this supernatural event happened and this demon overpowered and beat them, it said it came known to the Jews and Greek living in Ephesus. It said they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Wow. It takes a supernatural encounter of God. First, it takes preaching. Second, it takes God doing, moving something that he broods over that. And then when he starts brooding over, people start believing. It wasn't the handkerchiefs and aprons. It was because they started believing and when that starts happening, all the hell starts breaking loose. It starts stirring up. And he releases everything he can at you. But I'll tell you something. He'll throw the kitchen sink at you. But here's the good news. There's coming brokenness at this point. It said that people found their brokenness because they started looking and said, what we've had. I mean, they used to cast spells, do magic acts, do all kind of stuff. We ain't talking about Las Vegas magic acts. We're talking about conjuring up demons and stuff. We're talking about doing the, working in the darkness, doing those kind of things. And it said, this is what happened in them. It said that they held the name of the Lord in high honor because they saw power on power, seeing God versus this ugly power over here, and it overtook that ugly power. They said, man, there's something to this Jesus. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you, you won't be able to find a seat in the church in America if we would ever tap into that power again and not be afraid of what the enemy is going to throw at us. That day is going to come. we got to stand up and say, it doesn't matter. I want to proclaim Jesus Christ. I believe that day is going to be here soon, and we're going to have to make some tough decisions. Repentance came to people, and this is where God it is up to him to perform the miracles, not us. We are prompted at this point to repent. Because when you start seeing that name of Jesus held in high honor, it said there was a great repentance. It said, many of those who believe now open and confess their evil deeds. A number had practiced sorcery and their scrolls brought together. The public had burned them. It came up to 50,000 drachmas, which means the daily wage. 50,000 daily wages. And it says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. There was one word I, I use. I think it may be King James. The word of the Lord, this way, the word of the Lord grew and it prevailed. I want to say this in one of the versions. I love the word prevailed. To get to the prevailing, folks, you got to do the other steps. We cannot hope the word of God to prevail in America unless we preach it. Give God something to incubate in this community. Are you preaching to your neighbors? Are you talking to people around you? If you're doing that, God is incubating that word. He's doing that. He's hovering out. Can he do it without us? Yes, but he chose to do it with us. And he's given us the privilege and opportunity and power in us to do that. He could send thousands upon thousands of angels and proclaim. But what's the greater message is that the ones who have been redeemed, that we say so. That's what he's after. Those who have tasted of the grace of God. Give a story about that. The world will look at it and they'll say, man, there's got to be something to this. Even though all of Hades breaks loose, even though everything the devil can throw at you is there, repentance will come. And when repentance comes, it will actually break down the gates of Hades. 
It will do that. Repentance always does. It starts breaking. And folks, I want to tell you, this nation right now is in one of the greatest needs of brokenness that I've ever seen. We, we are so self-sufficient in the way that we operate, but we're in one of the greatest needs of brokenness. And, and really, to be honest with you, we have not seen that kind of revival in a while. I'm talking about a brokenness. The people were broken. They brought all their stuff together and said, in this way, how is this? In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power or it prevailed. And here's what I would ask you to do in your life. And this is the challenge of this sermon today. Do you want a prevailing in your life? And I named this where truth prevails. The only way truth's going to prevail is number one, we determine, determine in our hearts. It is our job to proclaim. It is. It's everyone's job here to proclaim to those around us. I'm not going to touch the people's lives that, Liz, you're going to touch. Dave, you're going to touch. Cindy, you're going to. I'm not going to do it. God has strategically placed them. Myra, he strategically placed you where you are. It is our job to proclaim to those that he has strategically placed us around. And you say, well, I'm not, I, don't know if, I don't know how to lead somebody to Jesus. He's asking you to proclaim. He will get them there. Just relax. You don't have to save anybody. All I got to do is proclaim. He saves them. That's all he's asking us to do, to be the fishers of men and women. I do believe that we are to proclaim. If you want the word to prevail, you got to prevail in your life. Truth prevail, you got to proclaim. That's the unadulterated gospel. That's not one that says, okay, everybody goes. It's one that says Jesus Christ is the only way, and the only way is through repentance and giving your life to Jesus Christ. And then secondly is we got to believe that God's word is true and that he will not let it return to him void. In other words, he's going to incubate that word. If we'll, lay, if we'll take the risk and lay the word out there, he is good to incubate that. That's what he did for that two years and three months in Paul. And things started breaking loose there. There was something that took place. That was a lot of sowing into one community. But something took place because he was willing to do it day in, day out, proclaiming the gospel, teaching them. And it said, that they, it said first, it said they honored the word. Secondly, they honored Jesus. Thirdly, it said it prevailed. Wow. Well, we got some steps to take, folks. And then don't be afraid when the heavens start stirring. Because let me tell you something. When the heavens start stirring, repentance and the evidence of that is coming next. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid when the enemy starts breaking loose. The heavens start stirring, I believe repentance can come. When the heavens start stirring, because we're starting to, I'm honestly starting to sense some things happening here in America. I don't know if it's good or bad, but there's some things happening in the heavenlies. There are some things being positioned right now that we're looking at and you're saying, well, you're sounding kind of mystic and ooey-gooey. No, I'm just telling you. What I can see and what I see is going on in the heavenlies and we're all kind of looking at it and going, how in the world is this unfolding like this? How in the world? Can't everybody see this? Well, the blinders that are on America, we better pray that it breaks free. We better pray that the church will speak truth. That's the only way you break the blinders off of those around us. And when you do that, you're proclaiming the word that Jesus Christ is the only way. And when we proclaim that Jesus Christ is the only way, yeah, you're going to have opposition. It's there. But folks, I want to tell you something. I, I remember going to school, and I had never come across before we went to Bethel College back in 1978. I couldn't even say the Baha'i religion. One guy who was from Iran, that was before the Iran hostage crisis, he was from there. He was trying to explain to me his religion. I'd a boy from the South here. I couldn't even say it. He was explaining it all to me, and I'm sitting there going, really? That's what you believe? How do you get to heaven? He was explaining that to me, and I was like, boy, you're a long way away. You ain't never going to get there. And I mean, my simpleton mind was, you need Jesus. Let me proclaim Jesus to you. And he was a nice guy. He really was. He wasn't one of the ones that came that would, you know, because I'd, I'd love to irritate him when I go in there because they marked out Israel on their world maps and you know, call it Palestine. I said, no, that's Israel. No, Palestine. You know, we get in an argument. But what I have found is that even in that, I would look at him and I'm going, you know what? It can only be Jesus. It can only be Jesus. Folks, let's commit ourselves to proclaim. No matter if a persecution comes, give God something to incubate in your friends around you. Use your message that God has put of grace in you. They need to hear it. If you've never stood by the graveside of someone that you know has refused Jesus Christ and you don't shudder, ask God to awaken your heart because I've done that. I shudder. 
we got to proclaim till he comes. Let's prepare now and let the word of God go forth. Let's stand. We're going to sing, I surrender all. If you need to make a commitment to Jesus Christ today and you never have, today is your day. I'm not talking about a church commitment. I'm talking about you'll commit to the church after that, but I want you to commit to Jesus first. And the church comes in there and you commit yourself to Jesus and then the church comes along and supports you there. But here's the second thing I ask. Would you commit today, Lord, no matter what it costs me, I'll stand. We started out this service with stand up for Jesus. I'm going to stand, God. Make that your commitment today. And you start your stand by proclaiming this day who your Jesus is. I surrender all. Just give me a day. Go. All to Jesus I surrender all to Him I breathe. quick before we break, um, I just wanted to share some really exciting news. If everybody can just have a seat really quick. Today is the beginning of something very